everybody. Welcome back to this series of videos in which I uh, go through the, the FRQ uh, progress checks from the College Board website that you joined earlier in the year. Um, we have arrived to the last unit, which is Unit 6, which is um, basically molecular genetics, the very last thing that we did um, before school was suspended or in-person school was suspended. Um, and so this is stuff that we just talked about um, and have been for a few weeks now. Um, basically, there the AP official AP unit six basically covers chapter 15, 16, sorry, uh, 16, 17, 18, which um, you know covered DNA structure and replication, transcription, translation, and then gene expression. Um, so this, this information should be fairly fresh in your minds, hopefully. Um, so let's, let's dive in and, and take a look at this question one. Um, and I actually had to split it, all the stuff over three pages because there's an awful lot. Um, so let's just take a look at the context here. So CD3 is a signaling protein that is typically found only in the plasma membrane of immune system T lymphocytes. Uh, so T cells, basically. Um, CD3 is composed of several different polypeptides, including a gamma chain, CD3 gamma. Um, scientists analyzed the promoter of the CD3 gamma chain gene for regulatory sequences that might have a positive or negative effect on the expression of the gene. The scientists cloned fragments of the CD3 gamma gene that included the first transcribed nucleotides plus up to 789 nucleotides of upstream regulatory sequences into plasmids in which gene for the fi in which the gene for the firefly enzyme luciferase immediately follows the fragment the plasmids were then introduced into a line of t lymphocytes and the cells were allowed to grow for a short while because the regulatory sequences of the cd3 gamma gene immediately precede the luciferase gene in the plasmids the activity either positive or negative of the regulatory sequences affected the amount of luciferase gene expression by the T lymphocytes. Luciferase catalyzes a reaction that results in the release of light and is responsible for the bioluminescence light flashes of fireflies. By quantifying the bioluminescence or luciferase activity in the cells, the scientists were able to determine the effects of each CD3 gamma gene fragment cloned into the plasmids on the expression of the gene. Okay, so this is definitely chapter 18 with shades of chapter 20. Um, and so this is the experiment that they did here, um, which should look somewhat familiar to you because you basically did a very similar experiment yourself. When we took the, um, the jellyfish gene, right, the, and inserted it in a bacterial plasmid and put it into E. coli bacteria. This is exactly the same thing that's happening, except instead of E. coli bacteria, it's a T lymphocyte. And instead of a jellyfish gene that will make it glow in the dark, it's a luciferase gene from a firefly that will glow. Other than that, it's the exact same experiment, right? It's the same process that you guys did. Um, so you should have a, a decent handle on, on how to analyze this, or at least how to understand the experiment. Um, because as you'll see here, um, the data that they get, their experiment was a little bit more involved. It certainly had more experimental groups than yours did, but we'll, we'll dive into that in a second. So let's take a look um, at part A, which of course has nothing to do with any of the data. Um, it just says, identify both the cellular component and the location of the component that is responsible for producing the luciferase protein from mRNAs as transcribed in the plasmid containing T lymphocytes. Explain what dictates to the lymphocytes the correct order in which amino acids should be linked to form the luciferase protein. Great. Okay, so this is just building proteins from mRNAs. So hopefully some bells are going off in your brain. That's like, okay, that's translation. Um, and as you guys all know, hopefully know, um, that's going to happen at the ribosome. So that's going to be the cellular component. Um is going to be the ribosome and that of course translation happens in the cytoplasm okay. um, and then so that's for part one and then 
Explain what dictates to lymphocytes the correct order in which the amino acid should be linked to form the luciferase protein, right? Because all proteins have a primary structure, and that's the order of amino acids. And the recipe for that is basically contained in the order of RNA nucleotides in the mRNA that's being translated, because that was transcribed from the DNA, directly from the DNA uh, in the nucleus. Okay, so let's take a look at B before they actually want you to dive into the data. They just want you to look at the, um, the, the experiment itself. So um, great, so part B, they basically want to, they want you to identify the independent variable in the experiment described. Okay, well, the independent variable, again, is the one that you change, right? Um, so it looks to me, or that the investigators change. So the, um, the independent variable, so they're testing the different lengths of promoter sequences, right? So basically the independent variable, okay, is going to be um, the, length, the, the length of the promoter sequence, um, or the nucleotide, uh, the length of the, sorry, the regulatory, regulatory sequences, those upstream regulatory sequences. Um, yeah, so the length of the regulatory, they go from anywhere from 15 uh, nucleotides all the way up to 789 nucleotides. So it looks like there's, oh, I don't know, nine experimental groups or something like that. Okay, so, um, and then, of course, the, the dependent, DV, if they asked you that, that would be what they're actually measuring, which is the amount of luciferase activity, the amount of uh, protein through, translated. Okay, um, so identify the plasmid that was used as a negative control. Okay, so the negative control, again, as we've seen before, is basically when the independent variable is not present. Right? So if you look at this, so okay, we've got base parallax, base parallax, and then, oh, we just have the parent plasmid, which does not have any sequences, right? So no sequence here, right? So that is going to be our negative control is, again, the one with nothing there, right? which is going to be the parent plasmid. And as you guys know, uh, plasmids, um, yeah, right, as you guys know, plasmids um, are those circular pieces of bacteria, of bacterial DNA that you can insert a gene in and, um, you know, put it in something else, just like you did with the, the plasmid with the jellyfish gene on it. Okay, and the, okay, so the last one is to justify the plasmid with the non-CD3 gamma active promoter in the experiments. So this means that there's an active promoter. It's just not from the gene that's being tested. And this is more of like, I guess, a positive control. And I don't think you need to say that specifically. But really what it is is just to make sure that, um, that luciferase activity will be um, transcribes like if you look at the plasmid just making sure that the experiment goes the way it's supposed to that if you put a promoter here it will pro promote uh, the translation of luciferase um, yeah, so that's going to be that last group is just to make sure uh, that luciferase Luciferase will be translated. Cool. Okay. Um, let's let's take a look here. So that was the first two parts. Um, ribosomes and the cytoplasm, or cytosols, two words for the same thing. Um, and then sequence of nucleotides in the mRNA dictates the amino acid sequence of luciferase. And yeah, this talks about how they're read three at a time, um, you know, one codon at a time, each amino acid. Um, and 
let's take a look at part B here. Um, let's see. So part B, the response indicates that the independent variable is the particular plasmid or that is the CD3 gamma regulatory sequence. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, the CD3 gamma regulatory sequence is introduced into the lymphocytes. So that's what we had said. Um, so for part B, negative control, parent plasmid, or the plasmid without any regulatory sequences inserted. So that's the same thing. Um, and then for this one, the response indicates that the plasmid with the non-CD3 gamma active promoter, positive control, effective introduction of the plasmids into the T lymphocytes, and for the successful use of the luciferase acid to measure promoter activity. So yeah, basically just to make sure that the plasmids are getting in and that the experiment is working as it should, meaning that um, the more that is produced, the more bioluminescence you get, the more luciferase activity you have. Okay, so let's look at the, the third and fourth parts. Um, so what they want you to do here is identify the plasmid that must contain the CD3 gamma core promoter sequence, but the fewest or no regulatory sequences, um, no negative regulatory sequences. Based on the data in figure two, describe the most, oh, well, just, we'll just go with that first. Um, so they're looking for something that has the promoter sequence, but the fewest or no <laughs> So basically they're saying what's got the most gas and the least break. Um, and that is clearly this one right here. Because as you can probably figure, the promoter is going to be like right here at the end. And then the regulatory sequences are going to be upstream. So this has no positive or negative. It just has the primary. It just has the primary and it's all gas. Um, okay, so let's look at the second part. So we can kind of mark that this is the uh, no negative, right? Because it's not inhibited, right? No negative control. Um, or no negative regulation. Um, and so now let's look at the second part. Describe the most likely cause of the variation in luciferase activity among the cells that contain plasmids uh, PCD3 gamma 419, right? So that's this one. Uh, 309, 239, and 199. So let's just kind of mark what they want us to look at. Because initially this could seem confusing because it seems like it's going up and down, right? Like there's no, there's no gradual increase or decrease. So it might be a little confusing at first, but basically you just have to think that it says that there are positive and negative sequences that are contained here. So basically, the more negatives you add, the slower it's going to go. Um, because it looks like, okay, let, let's take a look here. So at 199, right, it's, it produces, you know, 60, there's six, you know, they, they rate it a six, basically. Um, and so then at 239, it's less. So somewhere in this DNA segment, like if this is 199 base pairs, this is 239. It's, it's a longer piece of DNA. Somewhere here must be a negative regulatory sequence. And then here in between 239 and 309, that must be a positive. This, again, must be a negative. There must be a negative in there, right? So basically what you see here is, is pretty much like alternating positive and negative uh, control elements, positive and negative control elements. 
and basically and then you can kind of map where they are by figuring out if leaving those in cause more expression of the gene or less expression of the gene. Okay, and then calculate the approximate percent increase in luciferase activity between cells containing plasmid 59 and 149, round to the nearest whole number. So it looks to me like 149 is a, oh sorry, so we're going up from 59. Okay, so 59, I'm going to call that a 2, and... 149, I am going to call that a 4. So from 2 to 4 is doubling, or in percents, it's a 100% increase between the two. Okay, now predict the most likely observed level of luciferase activity if plasmid PCD. Uh, is introduced into a non-lymphoid cell, such as a line of kidney tissue cells. Provide reasoning to justify your prediction. Well, again, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the data, but as you all know, um, a cell only produces the proteins that it needs to produce to be that type of cell. So this gene is not going to be expressed in any other type of cell. There's going to be no luciferase activity because this gene, right, is because this promoter, right, RNA polymerase is not going to be able to bind at this promoter in that cell. Okay, there's nothing in the non-lymphoid cell that's going to cause this to be transcribed, and then translated. Because as you guys remember from chapter 18, right, the only cells, this was the answer to our question of why, you know, liver cells don't grow hair, right? Because the, um, the non-lymphoid cells, those are kidney cells, would not have, wouldn't have the right transcription factors. The correct transcription factors. Um, so it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able, right, they would not be able to, um, the RNA polymerase wouldn't be able to bind, and the gene wouldn't be able to transcribe. So let's just check really quick. Plasmid, no negative regulatory CVP, yep. Greatest luciferase activity is the 15. Different combinations of positive and negative regulatory sequences, and 100%. So then here, no luciferous activity because won't contain the transcription factors, right? The the activators specifically that are going to bind to these regulatory sequences. Um, when we talked about enhancers, these are the kind of things we're talking about here. So. Um, all right, so I know there was a lot there. Um, that question was pretty involved, um, but on the bright side, if you're going sequentially through these, you only have one more question to go. So I will be back with the last video in this series. So um, thanks for hanging in there, and uh, I'll see you soon.